This is Out of Bounds. This is, in fact, Out of Bounds, your home for the wild, weird, and wacky in the sports world every single week on the Know Your News Network. That's me, O'Brien. I'm John Alba. We are back in the back of a Cadillac, and we are pumping out content like there's no tomorrow. Mia, how was your trip to Kansas City? Oh, my trip was fantastic. Sp- speaking of uh, pumping out the content, John, I know you are a bit of a, a foodie, as I the know. kids like to yeah, say. you lied. You said last week that you weren't going to get a chance to eat some Kansas City barbecue, and I'm pretty sure I saw some Kansas City barbecue. That was because originally my flight was scheduled for much later on Friday evening, and then upon finding out a little bit more about our production schedule over at uh, the Mothership 1010XL, I was like, um, do you really want to fly me out at seven o'clock at night when there's a chance of snow? Or would you like to fly me out at 630 in the morning where yes, I will have to wake up early. However, I can also provide you more content because I will be there all day Friday. And then also, yes, I can partake in barbecue. Um, and so that is part of how, so that's what I was going to ask you, John. Um, you've never been to Kansas city. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, no, I've not. Are you familiar though with some of the, I know you're big diners, drive-ins and dives guy, food mm-hmm. network guy. So are you familiar with the different holy trinities that they yes. have of the different restaurants yes. out there. Mm-hmm. I'm familiar yes. with several. So I had been to Jack Stack when the Jaguars played the Chiefs in November. That was my first time ever going there. So I checked that one off the list for this year. Then this past Friday, um, which Jack Stack, let, let's give the give our uh, listeners an idea. Uh, Jack Stack is barbecue, but it's like a little bit more upscale inside. The barbecue is your favorite barbecue ever. The sides are unreal. Um, but the big thing with them is like, it looks like a nice restaurant inside. Keep that in mind. Because right. then the other big one is Joe's, which I know has been on the Food Network and it's been on Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. Mm-hmm. Literally out of a gas station. Mm-hmm. Um, awesome. That may have been the best ribs of all of them. And that was Friday night's adventure. Uh, the fries, uh, my good good friend, Andrew Gallo of NBC Sports, told me uh, you would leave your family for these fries, which is a wow. random thing to say about a barbecue restaurant, but he was correct. I took one bite and I went, oh my God, my life just changed. Um, so that was Friday. And then Saturday, um, I'd been to Gates Barbecue before, um, but we went back, circled there. The sauce is there. If you like spicy and uh, sweet. You know I do. Sweet heat. That's the spot. Now. That's the spot. The meat's good. The spices and the sauces excellent i'm into it i'm into it love hearing those stories i'm sure we'll have more over the years here on out of bounds i know your news if you got some kansas city barbecue stories or if you just want to get involved on the conversation today you know what to do kynchat.com or if you just want to leave a super chat right here on youtube as you're watching it you are more than welcome to do so you leave us a super chat We'll read it on air. It's as simple as that. It's the best and easiest way to get involved with this show as we are constantly monitoring what is going on in the chat. And boy, do we have a lot to chat about this week. So me, O'Brien, with that said, I'd like to propose an opening toast this week because uh, while there were certainly excellent football teams out there this weekend, we also saw plenty of futility. So here is a toast to futility. And everything that comes with the coaching carousel. Oh, yeah. okay. At first I thought you were like slighting the Jags. And I'm like, wait, is there something? I'm... No, 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 you're talking about one of our first talking points. I am. And with that, I would like to toast to America's team. A salute. Mm-hmm. That Sean Payton may be coaching very soon. Mm-hmm. By the way, I'm rocking the kombucha again. Like I did a couple episodes ago. Um, because the diet has to start, John, um, after I don't think I ate a vegetable that wasn't creamed corn um, for about five days there. Well, I got the perfect thing for your diet, and that's called February 5th. We're going to see the easing, soulful sounds of Bruce Springsteen and the East Street Band in Orlando, Florida. But before that, me, O'Brien, we head down to check in on the Dallas Cowboys, do we not? We do. And the wackiest play call you ever did see, Mr. John Alba. What is um, it? <laughs> yeah, what is it? That's a great question. Um, let's. So where do we want to start, I guess, is the real question. Because we actually have two talking points that we want to talk about when it comes to the Dallas Cowboys' loss to the San Francisco 49ers. Um, let's begin, though, with this crazy whatever this was at the end of the game. Um, they lose 19-12. to The running back was the center here, the one Zeke Elliott. You may be familiar with him. Um, 
it, it kind of looks like the fake punt, whatever you want to call it, that the Colts did a few years ago. Um, I, I mean, do you blame the special teams coordinator or do you blame Mike McCarthy, who is the head coach and the play caller, or do you blame Jerry Jones, who is the overlord and has a say in everything in the Dallas Cowboys organization no, this, for whatever that they was? Call this on like Madden, and they're like, "Yep, we're going to give this a shot. This, this, they'll never see this coming," and it it truly was incredible. I mean, just look at this again, Zeke Elliott right there around the twenty yard line just manhandled nobody guarding the other Niners D lineman right there. And you have four to my count on the near side of the screen, four eligible receivers who are open. And, right. Which included some offensive linemen, which included mostly offensive linemen. Yeah. And wildly enough, Dak Prescott doesn't throw to any of them. I'm confused. Can you have like nine men eligible downfield? I don't think you can. You have, let's see, so near side, I, I wish I had the, uh, you know, the pointer that I could, the telestrator. Yeah. Thing. Near side, you have an eligible the laser. receiver. The nearest, right there, near side, there's an eligible receiver. Far side, there's an eligible receiver. But you also have the three D, the three D backs there and linebackers for the Niners over the right side. So on the left side, Dak Prescott had space. Instead, he throws over the middle of the field. It's a really bad game for Dak Prescott. 23 of 37, 206 yards, a touchdown, two interceptions. But that doesn't tell the story of it. Questionable decision-making throughout, uh, including on this last drive that the Cowboys were even lucky enough to get in the first place because of some not very heads-up football from the San Francisco 49ers. There was the play in the end zone where Dak nearly got dropped for a safety. He didn't look like a playoff caliber quarterback, Mia. And it begs the question, does Dak deserve the flack for what happened with the Dallas Cowboys in, even though it was a one touchdown loss, they they felt like they were much further out of this one than they actually were. John, I know you have Daniel Jones as a top 10 quarterback in the National Football League. Um, So I'm curious in those same rankings, where does Dak Prescott fall in those top 10, top 20 rankings? I feel like, I feel like, Dak has been wildly, wildly underwhelming. I really feel like, because I think that's part of the element. This is a guy who got a monster contract, right? He got his monster contract and severely underperformed. He turns over the ball a lot. He turns over the ball more now than Daniel Jones does. That's for sure. He turns it over more than the top, 15 to 17 quarterbacks in the NFL. This is a guy who missed a large chunk of the season and still had more turnovers than most of the great quarterbacks in the league. So I don't think I put Dak Prescott in that conversation right now. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I I certainly don't, especially when you watch this game, his game management was piss poor. I don't. And I, I like, I just in general don't, I think that he is in that tier of he's a good quarterback but he's not a great quarterback, if that makes sense. Um, and that's amplified by the fact that look at the cast he has around him and how underwhelming yeah. they've been. I mean, he got the money, and then they went out and got C.D. Lamb in the draft mm-hmm. and they, to pair him with Michael Gallup and everybody else they already had. And then even Tony Pollard exceeds all expectations mm-hmm. to the point now that the Cowboys have a decision to make when it comes to him becoming an unrestricted free agent and Zeke Elliott's huge payday that they gave him a couple of years ago. And what do you do with that? Um so, yeah, that, that's where, for me, the disappointment with Dak Prescott begins because he has all the pieces around him. Yeah, maybe Mike McCarthy's not the ideal play caller, if you ask one Aaron Rodgers. Um, but at the same time, like, Kellen Moore, the offensive coordinator, was supposed to be this rising star in the National Football League. Um, John, did you see what Steve Smith, um, Carolina Panthers great, tweeted no, earlier please. about uh, – oh, I got to read this one for you. Um, so, Steve Smith, of course, the um, Car- Carolina Panthers great – um, tweets out. I want to make sure that I find, uh, here it is. Okay. So here it is. Steve Smith senior on, uh, on the old Twitter machine at Steve Smith senior 89. This is yesterday at 9 51 PM. Are you sitting down for this? I'm, I am in fact sitting. We, the Panthers interviewed Kellen Moore for the head coaching job based on the last play for the Cowboys. Ain't no way in hell Moore is coaching us with that trash last play. <laughs> oh, the turntables. I know a lot of people here in Duval County, where I'm coming at you from, um, love to talk about the fact that Byron Leftwich, the offense coordinator for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, was such a hot name on the market a year ago, and now he has since been fired by Tampa Bay. Um, 
I mean, Kellen Moore was another one this time last year who was ascending, who was this brilliant play caller. And even before Kellen Moore, you saw the Cowboys ranking in the top 10 offensively under Dak during the regular season, multiple seasons over. Um, I, it, it just doesn't make sense because they have all these, these pieces. They it, it works in the regular season, and then they get to the playoffs, and I don't know, maybe they buried some bodies or something somewhere. You tell me. Maybe they did. Our, our friend Sean Ross Sapp uh, chiming in. Go Bengals, Bengals win. Don't worry, we'll talk about the Sean, Bengals. Sean, we're going to get to the Bengals because I believe that Joe Burrow is a top two quarterback in we're the gonna National get to, Football We're going to get to Joe Swag in just a minute, but you were talking about tweets. The Dallas Cowboys tweeted this. This is from the team account. This was with the link to the game recap. Dak Prescott gave away the ball twice in the narrow loss to the 49ers in a matchup the Cowboys had a chance to win if they didn't again generate self-inflicted wounds. I cannot believe an official team account tweeted that effectively throwing Dak Prescott under the bus there. So once again, Mia, I pose the question, does Dak deserve the flack? Yes, he does deserve some of the flack because you some see- Some or a- the- Oh, the flack. Does he deserve um, it all? No, I don't think he deserves all of it because it's not his, you know, I mean, it's it's not like he's like self-imploding and throwing eight interceptions a game. I understand he's turning the ball over a lot. He turned the ball over, what, 10 times in 11 games he or something like that? More than turnovers. He, he had no command of the field in this game. None whatsoever, especially in the fourth quarter on the last drive and the drive preceding the last drive. No command whatsoever. And what do great, top 10 quarterbacks do when the pressure situations come up, they drive the team downfield. Eli Manning was never the flashiest quarterback, but damn, he was a quarterback you wanted with the ball in the last three minutes of the game. Right. Well, he was steady. You knew what you were going to get. Exactly. And that's not what you get with Dak Prescott. It's not, I I truthfully think there, there are other elements in play here, but I really do believe it all starts with your quarterback. And I don't believe Dak Prescott is as good as advertised. I, I just. And I also believe that there's definitely some weird juju going on. I don't know what sort of sacrifice the Jones family made in 1995 or whenever the last time was that the Cowboys actually made an NFC championship game in a Super Bowl. Um, but yeah, something weird. Something weird is going on. I mean, you can't be America's team if you don't win in nearly 30 years. You can't correct. be. I'm sorry. I correct. I don't think there's a dumber nickname in sports than calling the Dallas Cowboys America's team. Well, because here's my thing. Like, I appreciated some of the joking tweets about, like, oh, good thing for Cowboys fans that uh, LeBron and the Lakers have it rolling and the Yankees gave Aaron Judge all that money. You don't call the Lakers or the Yankees America's team, do you? So why do we call the Cowboys that? It's just beyond them. Uh, and things continue to be especially dumb. Yeah, yeah. We, we See, we, we're not going in chronological order in this game, John, because no. there were things, there were antics happening yeah. during the pregame. Tell us Yeah, th- there were antics during the pregame. So, Mia, who, who is this poor man right here? Um, that is um, a man who uh, doesn't want to be known. He's going to probably change his name and move to Mexico. Um, that is Brett Mayer. Uh, he is the kicker for the Dallas yes. Cowboys for yes. now. He is for, for now. now. So this poor man missed four extra points last week, yet the Cowboys managed to live to see another day. So he got out before the pregame after the Cowboys ensured him, you will be our kicker for this division round game. And he was trying to get his warmups in. And there was a little brush up between the coaches, (laughs) the 49ers and the Cowboys and some personnel. Well, fast forward to the game and he has an extra point attempt blocked and it was blocked because it was totally shanked i mean if you're looking at the picture right there you can see the ball came off the upper part of his ankle this wasn't going anywhere close to the uprights this is really crazy stuff he at this point he's got the yips it's the chuck knoblock yips you can get out of the yips for what it's worth i mean look at jason myers the question is does he deserve another shot here mia um, yeah, because it's like the end of the year, so you at least bring him back into camp. And so long as he doesn't kick it and it hits a former NFL head coach, like happened in Jacksonville this training camp. Um, yes, we had a, a rookie kicker who um, his kick shanked off and almost hit one Dave Campo of the Dallas Cowboys. Coincidentally, former Super Bowl winning head coach. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, I, I think you bring him back in camp. You see, you just dismiss it as he had the yips. Um, while yes, I think it's really mentally tough for him to go back. Um, he isn't the reason that. They lost the game. I mean, well, te- I technically he is. 
Yeah, yes. I just want to say, thankfully, this game did not come down to him. Right. Because he wouldn't have been able to come back if he no. misses a game-winning field goal. No, and, you know, I see a lot of people piling on this guy. And you know it means quite a bit emotionally if I'm sitting here defending a Dallas Cowboy. But I think people were way too rough on this guy. He, he had the yips, which if you followed the whole Chuck Knobloch saga from 20 plus years ago, he was the America's Yankee, other team. He was the Yankee second baseman, second base to first base, a very short throw. And he just somewhat out of nowhere lost the ability to throw the ball from his position in second base to first. He was airmailing the ball into the seats. I actually went to school with someone whose mom was hit by a Chuck Knobloch oh errant yip throw. It's it's sad because you just mentally can't do it. And, and it is a mental thing it, more than it is a physical thing, anything else. So I did feel like people were coming down too hard on this guy. I believe he does a little more grace. But, man, this was really, really rough. And when the pregame picture surfaced of Jerry Jones talking to him, people were like, he's giving him words of encouragement. And I was like, man. Yes, because Jerry Jerry Jones has played so much football. Well, I, was like, I was like, you sure it's words of encouragement or it's not? Listen, if you ever want to see your puppy again, you got to make these kicks. Like, that's what I was more concerned about. When you walk out to the car later and your tires are slashed right, when exactly. you return to Dallas, just know exactly. that I did it. Yeah. Um, no, I, I do think you bring him back. You try to give him a second chance. Um, I, I'll say this much. Um, Jason Myers, who just got a huge payday out in Seattle, is their kicker. The Jags cut him midway through the 2017 season because he had the yips. Um, and now here we are five years later, and he's getting a big payday, and he's making his kicks again. So um, I, I do firmly believe in the yips. I, I'm pretty sure you do as well. So I would bring him back. It's just an unfortunate circumstance that it happened to happen kickers, in standalone playoff games. And kickers have longevity in the NFL. Kickers play very late. And it's very much what have you done for me lately with kickers. Kickers can be redeemed pretty easily. People forget. I'll use another Giants example here. Lawrence Tynes in the 2010 mm -hmm. NFC Championship game. Uh, they're playing in frigid Green Bay. He misses his first two kicks of the night. Uh, including one that would have sent the Giants to the Super Bowl, and then he gets his redemption over time. It's very much turn the page, wash your hands, and and see what you can do in the future with kickers. So I hope. Well, hell, speaking of Green Bay, Mason Crosby has been there forever, and there was a notion earlier this year where he wasn't making a couple kicks, and it was Aaron Rodgers looking around like, "Hey, do, do we kick? Do we keep him? Right. Do we do we get rid of him? I mean, and that's a guy who's been there forever." I'm just really glad this game. Did not come down to a field goal attempt or, for that matter, had Dallas scored and it came down to an extra point attempt. Uh, but but also, I do want to say this, too. It is not uncommon now for kickers to miss extra points ever since they moved it back. They moved it back a few years ago and kickers miss extra points now. It's a thing that happens. You see it just about every single week in the NFL. At least someone misses an extra point. So... Was it an anomaly, an outlier that this dude missed four in a game? Yeah, I, I would think so. But it is something to watch for Dallas going next year. And I must admit, there's just something oddly poetic about it. Just something. I just want to know, like, where are the bodies buried? What sacrifice did Jerry make? That's I would like to do a story on that. Um, speaking of stories, I have one for you, um, John. Did you ever hear of the Four Falls of Buffalo? I have. Yeah, it's an ESPN 30 for 30. They're going to have to make another one because, wait for it, the Bills, for a third straight year, cannot get out of the divisional round of the playoffs. They continue to bill as they lose to the Bengals on home turf. Mind you, they were 13-1 and all-time in home playoff games. The one loss, previous loss game to the Jacksonville Jaguars in 1996. Um, now 13-2 all-time on home turf. They once again find themselves looking around, wondering what the heck happened. Uh, John, are they a cursed franchise? Uh, that's a sad picture, isn't it? It's super sad, but also like I thought about this a lot as someone who even picked the Bills on my day on my day show, uh, XL Primetime on 1010XL. Um, this is a Bills team that, while yes, this is their window right now, and they were built to make a Super Bowl and this, that, and the other. And when you look at where they've invested draft capital and free agency, like yes, they should be in the conversation. But when you consider the elements that they were playing in, which again, home turf, they should be used to the snow, and I think they were. Um, look at the run game. 
I want to read you. I want to read you. You don't even have to look at it. I will read it for you, John Alba. Um, here are the rushing stats for the Buffalo Bills in the snow on Sunday afternoon. Um, Josh Allen, the quarterback, was the leading rusher. Eight carries for 26 yards. That's a 3.3 yard per clip average. Devin Singletary, six carries for 24 yards. James Cook, five carries for 13 yards. And I understand that was a byproduct of having to abandon the run because they were down 14 nothing basically from the jump. But at the same time, in that sort of environment, I don't care that you have a Wyoming wild man at quarterback. Like, you need to run the ball, especially when yeah. Joe Mixon is doing what he's doing yeah. on the other side and rushing for, oh, uh, wait for it, over 100 yards on 20 carries. There are two elements in play here. Number one, it, it was pretty apparent, even from the midseason point, just what losing – the coaching staff that the Bills lost last offseason had in terms of an impact on prior to Demar Hamlin, prior to anything with Demar Hamlin, they losing Brian Dayball and some of those guys, it, it, it was impactful because are you saying you didn't like Ken Dorsey's blow up, John? I'm just suggesting that maybe they should have uh, potentially taken a look into that crystal ball and said, "Man, we got to do everything we can to retain this Dayball guy," but. That is the first thing that needs to be said. The second thing that needs to be said is with the DeMar Hamlin stuff, let's not forget and let's give this team a little bit of grace in that just a few weeks ago, this team thought that one of their teammates died on the field and they had to go to emotional support therapy and counseling. That's a really heavy thing to deal with in terms of sustaining any momentum on a football field. So I'm going to give them a little bit of grace I'll say this, that window is closing fast. And when I say fast, I mean like next year's your year. And if you you don't make it happen by next year, there's going to be some serious questions about does Buffalo just blow it all up or not. And with the amount of talent that they've had, including Stefan Diggs, it just what a miss that would be for Buffalo. And you do have to give credit on the other side. Joe Burrow is going to win a Super Bowl, and it very well may be this year. It very well may be this year. He is every bit of daddy swagger that you could possibly want from an NFL quarterback. He's a game manager. He's got a big arm. He's got weapons around him. Big kudos, Mia. More than talking about a Bills team that's cursed, big kudos to a Bengals franchise that did the work and did the rebuild the right way and in a fast, efficient way as well. Well, that's the thing with the DeMar Hamlin tragedy, which obviously, you know, we're, we're glad to hear he's doing great. But, John, in the however many minutes it was that that game was played before it was canceled after his medical emergency, the Bengals marched right down the field and scored a touchdown. Joe Burrow, what was he, like 7 of 8 to begin that game? He was 9 of 9 to begin the game on, sa- on Sunday this afternoon. So, yeah. I'm going to go with as much as, yes, this is a Bengals team that has dealt with a lot. At the same time, this is also a – Bang, or excuse me, a Bills team that's dealt with a lot. This is a Bengals team that might just be better. And, and that's that. And I think it speaks to the way the NFL is headed in terms of an offensive football game where points are at a premium. You see that with Kansas City and the Chiefs and what they've built out there. And now you're seeing it with the Bengals where their defense, yes, sometimes it can be suspect, but they've invested enough in free agency that it does just enough. And the fact of the matter is, is if you have Burrow and Jamar Chase – and then you add all those other pieces they have, you're always going to have a chance. Um, what I think is most fascinating with Joe Burrow, and I want your take on this, John. I think he's the new Tom Brady because I think he has the clutch sheet. The difference is he is more vocal than Brady. Mm-hmm. He is more in your face. Better go get them refunds. Mm-hmm. But which I love him. Which was I love him. I think he's awesome. And maybe part of that is because of his college journey and knowing that, obviously, he had to leave his dream school at Ohio State. He came to LSU. He created with Coach O, one of the greatest college football teams we've ever seen. He was a humble guy. Louisiana took him in. Like, maybe that's why. But I don't know. I See, I look at him, and I look at Brady, and I see, I see the clutch gene. But I can't stand Brady, and I love Joe Burrow. Before I answer, I want to send a special thanks to the Rave Bay for Super Sticker 999. We appreciate you. If you want to get in on the action with the Super Chats, kynchat.com, or right here in the YouTube chat, just like our friend the Rave Bay. I see you, Rave Bay. See what you did there. If you want to get in on the fun, send us those Super Chats. We'll read your comments on air. Listen, I, I think the Brady comparison is great. He's a pocket quarterback, big arm, efficient. Uh, does Gamer, everything winner well does everything that i just said dak prescott doesn't do right like managing things downfield marching forward 
And when you're playing from behind, you know that Joe Burrow can give you the lead. And that's everything you look for in a great quarterback. The swagger, I can't get the swagger. I just, I see that shot of him after the national championship game with the cigar in his mouth. That's potential face of the league caliber stuff. Right. And the crazy part is, is now, and it's funny because I was asked this on my other program on 1010 uh, Helmets and Heels last week in terms of looking at Allen versus Burrow, Josh Allen versus Joe Burrow. Who do you put two, three among the best quarterbacks in the National Football League? And where does Trevor Lawrence fit in there? Um, The question is, in terms of fourth quarter comebacks, I mean, even your boy Daniel Jones has got more street cred these days. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Than Josh Allen in that category. And that's the bigger overarching conversation. It's not, are the Bills cursed? It's, can the Bills, like, actually be among these teams, which, as of this writing, the Giants and the Jaguars are in that conversation where we're down two scores in the fourth quarter and our guy can lead us down the field. Yeah, I I would trust Trevor Lawrence and Daniel Jones to do that, even with the game that Daniel Jones had this week, and we'll get into that in a minute here. But uh, I still would trust those guys almost equally as Josh Allen, despite Josh Allen having the accolades. So coaching's a big part of it. Elements play part of it as well. Your opponent plays part of it, but it was not an encouraging sign for the Bills. There were dropped passes in this one. They couldn't get the run game going. You're absolutely right, 100%. Uh, But like I said earlier in the show, Mia, you were out in Kansas City to see the Jaguars and the Chiefs go at it. That is not Patrick Mahomes. No. His dad played Major League Baseball. That is Chad Henney, who's that dad, doesn't I, even like. I, that looks like some guy that is a janitor at a local elementary school that they had to have come in off the street, like when they have the emergency hockey goalies. Like that's what that looks like. I don't believe Chad Henney's dad played Major League Baseball, but Patrick Mahomes suffered a high ankle sprain in the team's win Saturday over the Jags, and in his absence, Chad Henney, former Jaguar himself, perennial backup, thirty-seven years old led the Chiefs to a key 98-yard touchdown drive that kept Jacksonville at an arm's distance. Chad Henney was awesome on this drive. Does his presence in a game like this, and potentially next week in the AFC Championship game, Mia, prove the value of having a quality veteran backup quarterback? Oh, undoubtedly. Uh, I'm not sure that Chad Henney is that quality. I think he also uh, benefits greatly from having a guy by the name of Travis Kelsey uh, that had 14 catches on 17 targets against the Jaguars um, who had no answer for him. I mean, they, they rotated different linebackers on him. They rotated defensive ends on him. They tried a safety briefly too. I mean, I don't know how the only team we went back and we looked today, the only team that limited Travis Kelsey to under 40 yards a game this year was the Las Vegas Raiders. I'm not sure what they did. If someone out there knows, please comment, leave a super chat um, or leave a comment on YouTube. I don't know how they defended him and limited him like that because no one else can. And so it doesn't matter who's throwing him the ball. He was figuring a way. Um, And then you consider the play of our boy, fellow New Jersey native, Isaiah Pacheco, the Rutgers alum, the running back, the rookie running back, might I add, for your Kansas City Chiefs. And the fact that he went over 90 yards again against the Jaguars. Um, So, yeah, I mean, that's where I look at all those pieces around Chad Henney and I say, okay, you know what? If you can create an environment around, you know, the the worst case scenario, which is your franchise quarterback goes down, but they're able to function within the system, then yeah, like that's where you don't want a situation. I mean, heaven forbid you have a situation like the Miami Dolphins where they're on quarterback number three or the Baltimore Ravens who are in the same boat. Like you need to have someone who can step in and manage the system around them. Um, but if you leave them with an empty cupboard, then I don't think Chad Henney would have done what he I did. I think Chad Henney still is a high-quality backup who proves it year in and year out. He's This is not the first time that Chad Henney, with the Chiefs alone, has been thrust in a situation like this. And he has stepped up, and he has held firm. That's what a backup quarterback is supposed to do. A backup quarterback isn't necessarily there just to win, but it's to try to keep things from getting worse you know and that's uh, what Chad Henney has done he's one of the highest paid backups in the league for a reason he's remarkably consistent and the other thing with your backup quarterback to Mia is your backup quarterback in your preparation week is a critical part of preparation in terms of making sure that your defense is reading coverages correctly like that that is a very important role that a backup quarterback takes on and having a guy like Chad Henney who's well traveled and so efficiently I, this drive was a master class and I understand he's got Kelsey there but it was a master class in game management tempo management and bouncing back in the face of adversity because when you lose your star quarterback 
that could be a gut punch. Some teams may unfold after something like that happens. Yeah, and I'll give Chad. I will give Chad Henney this, John. I mean, Andy Reid didn't change the playbook. No. Well, they certainly handed the ball off a little bit more. They didn't change the playbook. No. And that was what I fully anticipated. I was like, all right, here come some bubble screens. Here come some swing passes in the flat. They were aggressive, and they kept going downfield. I, again, I say this every week, I feel like. And I've said it like five times this episode already. NFL teams just go downfield. You don't got to get cute. Like, make the Is that because teams... the Giants didn't do that on Saturday, John? It's, it's not even just that. Just make sure that the other teams make you pay for your mistakes. Like, reap what you sow. And if you're going to at least go downfield, well, then – Your fans can't give you crap for it. Your players are going to know, okay, well, we did everything we could to be aggressive. There's a difference between being over-aggressive and and being a standard downfield offense. But to me, too many teams just played so conservatively. Kansas City could have just let it go on the ground here. They didn't because I do believe there's quality in having a backup quarterback. You look at just about every team that wins a Super Bowl has a quality backup quarterback in some capacity. It's important in preparation. It's important in game time. And yes, if you want to talk about what happened with the Giants. Let's do it, Mia. Yay, let's do it, because I barely watched this game at all because I was working in the Chiefs' uh, press room, and uh, then I heard the score, and I went, okay, I don't need to watch this. Look at that. Uh, Yeah, the the Giants were mutilated by the Philadelphia Eagles, 38-7. to Uh, The Eagles are now 24-6 and against the Giants in their last 30 meetings. John, why is that one team can struggle so much against one franchise in particular? Why do Achilles heels exist? WebMD, please help us. Isn't that an amazing stat? 30 matchups. The Eagles are 24 and six. I believe it only because that's what the Jacksonville Jaguars are against the Tennessee Titans. I'm pretty sure. For whatever reason, the Giants just cannot get it done against Philly. And I think part of it is. Philly's just a really hard place to play, no matter how good Philly is or how bad Philly is on any given year. Playing at Lincoln Financial Field is a really difficult thing to do. I think there's a lesson to be learned here, Mia. In week 18, when the Giants played the Eagles, the Giants rested pretty much everybody because they were locked in in that number six seed. No matter what, that's where they were going to be. Charger fans commend you guys for doing that, by the way. and, And I get it. I understand why the Giants did it. But there may have been value in even giving them a quarter's worth of play. Because what happened was, it's not that Daniel Jones was necessarily bad in this game. He was pressured the second most amount of times in recorded NFL history in a game. So what does that tell you? That tells you your offensive line just totally collapsed in this one. And that had been a question mark for the Giants all season long. They showed they showed that they had gone a lot better. Uh, but they weren't used to the environment because pretty much all the Giants starters sat in that game in Philadelphia. And I do believe that does bring back now that conversation as to should you rest your players in a meaningless game? I think you should for the most part, but I do think there's value in having them play. And, uh, yeah, I I think that was one of the biggest reasons the Giants got clobbered in the way they did this past week. Right, and I shouldn't talk because um, the Jaguars technically had a meaningless game week 17 against the Houston Texans because it was all going to come down to that Titans matchup week 18 at home in Jacksonville. The Titans, essentially, that same week 17, were faced with a meaningless game against the Cowboys, and they did rest all their starters, and they did lose that game. That obviously helped them be competitive, in my estimation, personally, week 18 against the Jags because they rested all the guys that were injured. The guys that were healthy played. To your point, those guys played. But resting them to conserve their bodies ended up proving critical. The Jaguars, on the other hand, Doug Peterson played everybody because the team was healthy. And somehow, someway, knock on wood, um, this is probably an NFL record. The fact that the blue tent didn't go up once in that game for either side. Mm -hmm. And the Jaguars went up 21-0 before the end of the first quarter. And so he was looking around like, well, I, I guess I can pull everybody now. So it just worked out for them that way. You can't say that it would have worked out that way going up against a defensive front like the Philadelphia Eagles have week 18 because what happens if Daniel Jones gets hurt that game sure a hundred percent that's what I said like maybe you play a quarter or something like that just to get these guys out there and see this is what you could be facing the Giants knew there was a possibility they'd be playing the Eagles in the playoffs so I think it is important to expose your very young team 
to these environments like that. And I think that's a lot of the reason why the Giants have struggled so much with Philadelphia historically. They just weren't prepared. And I don't know if it's coaching. I don't know if it's playing. It was a bunch of things. Again, I said this last week. The Giants got there in the first place. Never would have expected them to have even been there. And, uh, you know, they, they were reminded that, A, they were appropriately ranked as the number six seed in this postseason. And B, the Philadelphia Eagles are really freaking good football. Oh, yeah, absolutely. There what's are what's really wild with the Eagles for me, John, and like I was actually talking with an Uber driver yesterday about this. Um, what's so wild in Kansas, in Kansas City, mind you, what we were discussing is the fact that, yes, listen, Howie Roseman deserves all the credit. Jeff, Jeffrey Laurie deserves the credit, just like Trent Baalke deserves the credit in Jacksonville that the owner stuck by his guy, let the coach walk, let everybody else question the move, but stuck by his guy and the guy paid dividends. Like, I, I will give him that. But at the same time, when you look at that Eagles team, it still has the same grit and the same mindset as it did under Andy Reid over a decade ago. And I do still think Doug Peterson's fingerprints are on it as well. And so that was the conversation I was having with this Kansas City Chiefs fan, Uber driver. I was like, it's pretty wild to think that the best team in the National Football League, if it's not Kansas City, it's probably Philly. And the two coaches that just coached in this game tonight, those are the ones that truly, when you go to the foundation of that team, and I understand neither of them were there for a lot of the recent drafts. Um, and by recent, I mean the last two, because Doug was there three before that. Um, but there's something to be said about – the mindset, the moxie of that team. And so when we talk about the Chiefs and the Jags earlier in the program and we talk about those two squads, it's fascinating because both of them are so offensively driven. And then you look at the Eagles, and while, yes, Jalen Hurts is doing what he's doing, and it was awesome to see them run the ball the way they did. Shout out to Boston Scott, by the way, the Boston Tea Party coming to you uh, next season. This but team can only play against one team, and it's right. But it's so, but I still, when I think of the Eagles, yes, I think of Jalen Hurts, but I also think that they're so predicated on defense, just like that 2017. Well, I mean, that's what, team. again, look what I just said to you. And that's, yeah, that the most, I think it's just fascinating most- that these two offensive wizards, and I mean, yes, Nick Sirianni is a defensive guy, but. But like these two offensive wizards laid the foundation of what that program, because it's not a franchise, it's a program, like what it is. And, uh, and it's still the defense that that's yeah. what was their hallmark in 2017. And that's what it is now. Yeah. I mean, again, second most pressures since 2009, when that started to be recorded, it's just crazy. Just absolutely crazy. Daniel Jones could have been the most elite quarterback in the league. And he stood no chance against the way that that Eagles team blitzed him. Can I read for you my favorite tweet from the game? Go for it. This is all I needed to know about how the game was going. So, you know, um, Steve, I always butcher his last name, and I've told him this in person, Politi, Politi. Politi, Steve Politi. Politi, yes, thank you. Good. My mom pronounces it Politi, and she sends him emails all the time. Shout out to Steve-O. I told him, too. She sends him emails, and she's always like, you're my favorite writer, and my daughter is a sports broadcaster. He is a great writer. He's one of my favorite writers in the country. Um, So old Steve tweeted, the Eagle fans in front of me just typed F the Giants on his phone and then held it up to me against the press box glass. So at least I make friends and then he took a picture of them through the glass That's and good. he goes my new friends congrats That's fellas I well someone who's not making any friends mia o'brien is shannon sharp oh my god like i missed a lot of this live because i was like in the central time zone and i was eating dinner again the shout out to joe's barbecue was fantastic out in kansas city and all of a sudden i'm seeing my phone blow up about shannon sharp um before there were, was the m M&M m spokesperson debate this was the hot topic over the weekend mm. let's go through this Blow by blow, pro, pun so, intended. Pro football um, Hall of Famer Shannon Sharp, host of the Undisputed with Skip Bayless. Yeah, let's Walker. go through it. Yeah, so this was after the second quarter buzzer in Friday night's game between the Grizzlies and Lakers. This is in L.A. Shannon Sharp's there. He's seated near the court. And all of a sudden, there's a shouting match that starts. Dylan Brooks, Stephen Adams, John Morant, and even John Morant's father, T. Morant, gather on the sideline opposite their bench, And they approach him, and there's a confrontation, and it eventually gets settled. And after it happened, Sharp gave an interview and said, quote, they didn't want this smoke, Dave. They do all that talking and jockeying, and I ain't about that jockeying. It started with Dylan Brooks. I said he was too small to guard LeBron. He said, F me. I said, F you back. He started to come at me, and I said, you don't want these problems. And then Ja came out of nowhere talking. He definitely didn't want these problems. Then the dad came and he obviously didn't want no problems. 
So the question is, Mia O'Brien, who exactly wanted the problems? Well, I mean, the obvious answer is Shannon Sharp, and I think that that's needless to say. But I do want to note, as we're going through this, John, um, being the college basketball um, voter and the AP poll that I am and like being the big college basketball fan that I am, Dylan Brooks has the distinction of being like one of seven opposing players that has ever played Duke that got under Coach K's skin to the point that there was a near feud on the bench in the handshake line. And so if there was any NBA player that was going to start this, not name Grayson Allen, um, I'm actually kind of happy it was Dylan Brooks because it further feeds into that agenda of Coach K was right. Um, this kid is a little hit man, you know? Um, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I kind of love that personally. I think that storyline's hilarious. Um, but no, this is Shannon Sharp, and the Dave he's referring to, I'm pretty sure, is the ESPN reporter Correct. who covers the Lakers. Correct. Um, and, and so, the, like, it was just a huge media stunt. Like, what are we doing? Also, what time was the game at? Like, 6 o'clock on Pacific yeah, well, time? Well, yeah, like, what and, are we doing? And if this was an, a normal fan, that fan would have been immediately ejected, and there would have yeah. been a huge brouhaha. Shannon also, Sharp how did Jaws' dad end up over there? That's yeah, what's crazy. I don't, I don't know about that, but th- this – Shannon Sharp's in the wrong here. You can't be a fan chirping with players. You just can't Uh, because the expectation on the other end, if this happened when Shannon Sharp was playing football and a fan who was near a sideline was saying derogatory things to him or whatever, he would want that fan gone. So just because he's a staunch LeBron supporter doesn't give him the right to chirp at players while they're actively in the game. There's taunting and then there's, wanting the smoke and i just not about it mia well especially like here's my thing like shannon sharp was in a positive light because of all the skip bayless Demar hamlin questionable tweets over the last few weeks like i mean his foil was the evil one and shannon everybody's like yeah take a day off man like you make your statement like good for you and then you go and you pull this like what are we doing, man? Like you were, you were looking in the good light, and then yeah, you have to go and pick a fight. Killing goodwill, not something you want to do when you are opposite Skip Bayless. I promise you that. Um, listen, it, it seems like it's all water under the bridge. Hopefully, Shannon Sharp doesn't find himself chirping at anybody else. But let's keep the chirping to the TV show, not what's going on on the court. We keep moving, Mia. What do we got next? Yes, uh, and we do appreciate all our comments and our super chats, by the way. Keep those coming. I see uh, we got Ace Shock predicting an Eagles versus Bengals Super Bowl. I don't know, uh, John, did Sean Ross Sapp, like, it, tell all the Bengals fans that they needed to watch us? Like, Sean they're Ross coming Sapp. out of the woodwork right now. Sean Ross Sapp is nearly 300,000 Twitter followers, so it's very possible. So Okay, well, hey, he's getting the Bengals fans to come out of the woodwork. Um, we can circle back to the Bengals. I think we are going to have a little bit of time, and so we can preview the divisional round. But first, let's hit the ice, John Alba. Oh, no, we're, um, you're skipping one here, man. Oh, I skipped got, one. I didn't even did, realize. You did. They got, and I'm, I'm mad at you for skipping this because this is like my favorite thing in the world. It really is. It really is your favorite thing in the whole wide so world. This looks like a very complicated graph, but I promise you, it's not. Okay, let me let me take a look. Hold on, I'm I'm pulling up. So, I, oh, you actually made a graphic for me. Perfect, even better. Um, if you're wondering what this weird sequence of numbers is, folks, um, this is the Baseball Hall of Fame, um, calculations with regards to the public anonymous, all the votes that are calculated for the pro, excuse me, the baseball hall of fame, which of course this year's class is coming tomorrow. Bold prediction time, John. Is anyone getting in, in the class of 2023? So thank you to at not Mr. Tibbs, Ryan Thibodeau, who every year does a hall of fame ballot tracker. And it's just amazing. He's really played a significant role in shaping the narrative of hall of famers and keeping track. And this is going to be a really controversial next two years here, me O'Brien, because uh, if you can see it there. So for those who are unfamiliar with the Baseball Hall of Fame voting, Jordan Katz and I got to do a segment on this when you were gone one week. But now I'm excited to have you on here to talk about this. You need 75 percent of the vote to get it. OK, you need 75 percent of the vote. And as things stand right now, with 46.2 percent of the ballots known, Todd Helton and Scott Rowland would be getting in. Both guys who just a few years ago looked like they had no chance of getting in whatsoever. But because we have changed how we look at potential Hall of Famers and gone are the how many home runs did you hit? How many hits did you have? And now we're looking more at metrics and whatnot. There's a legitimate conversation for both of them, especially Mia, 79.2% with about 
50% of the ballots in. My gut tells me, and I hate to say this, but I think both guys are going to just miss this year. And I think next year, both of them will get in. What say you? I'll, I'll go pull that graphic back up. I just want to look sure. at some more of those names. Your I, boy, I saw Houston. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I, we could talk about that too. I just saw Houston Street and I was like, why? Yeah. Why is he on this list? Well, well, you know, you play enough. I mean, you t- like at least Mike Napoli was an Iron Man. I'm like, okay, stay, that one's stay okay. on the ballot. Colby yeah. Ellsbury, he's been retired that long. No, right? Doesn't make it. All right, good. Dickie, what are we doing? You stay on the ballot. You need to get at least five percent of the vote, and uh, those guys will not be staying on the ballot. They will be one and dones. But it is. I mean, you look at it right there. Todd Helton, Scott Rowland, and Billy Wagner, especially have really made climbs and all three of them are probably going to get in the hall of fame at some point soon, but it's quite a testament, isn't it? To how we change because on the eye test alone, a lot of people probably wouldn't look at a guy like Scott Rowland as a hall of famer, but he was was like the third best player on his own team. I mean, it was a great team. Remarkably consistent. Right. Uh, He was one of the best offensive third baseman of his era, one of the best defensive third baseman of his era, but he played under the radar. And that's why I love this hall of fame period because we give some people a little extra look and a deep dive into what made them great players. So, so what do you think? Do you see any of these guys getting in? We know Fred McGriff's going in. He got inducted by the uh, modern era committee already, but this is all the sports writers. Right. Um, I mean, statistically speaking, if we're going off the numbers, then yeah, it does sound like Scott Rowland has a case. I do love the Todd Helton story only because he is like the first guy that I truly remember making the Colorado Rockies relevant. Um, And as someone who was just out in Canton for the pro football hall of fame enshrinement with the first ever Jaguar and Tony Baselli, like I enjoy when there's a player who plays all of, if not the majority of their career with one team and they bring that team to the forefront of yeah. their sport. And so yeah. that is where I, I want to give Todd Helton a little bit of love because I do appreciate what he did for Colorado. Yes, you could talk about how the balls are inflated and this, that, and the other. Um, but I really appreciate that about him. I don't even know. Are there any Colorado Rockies well, in the Hall of Fame? Yeah, you're going to stoke some fires here, Mia, because you're you're surpassing the famous Blake Street Bombers of the 90s led by Larry Walker. Who oh, went- duh, my bad. Fame. Uh, this past uh, two years ago, I believe he went in or three years ago it was two or three years ago. He went in. And but I don't got... think of Larry Walker as a Rocky. Really? No, I really he's don't. He played for the Cardinals, didn't he? For a year. Yeah, I think of him with the Cardinals. I don't know. Maybe that's just Real. me. Maybe maybe I'm a weirdo because he won a World Series with the Cardinals, didn't he? Uh, he went to a World Series with them. Yeah, that's what I thought. He didn't yeah. win it with them, but he was only with them for a year. He, he yeah. spent most of his career with uh, the Rockies, played for the Expos, I believe, as but well. I, but... When you think of the Colorado Rockies in the 2000s, John, who do you think of? Well, Todd Helen was their mainstay in the 2000s, for sure. He was their Derek Jeter. He helped bring them to a World Series in 07. But you mentioned the, I think you said inflated balls. So I think you yes. meant the altitude there. Yes, I meant uh, the altitude. But uh, what's remarkable is, and this is what I want to talk about with how the modern era of hall of fame voting has changed candidates we've been able with stats like jaws and and changing like adjusted ballpark stats to see that todd helen was just as good of a road player as he was a home player and i want to point to jason stark and give him a plug who did a fantastic fantastic uh, deep dive on the candidates that he voted for uh, including Scott Rowland and Todd Helton. He really did a fantastic job. Go check that out on The Athletic. Those adjusted stats help a guy like Todd Helton. Meanwhile, a guy like Andrew Jones, who's at 68.3% here, uh, he's someone who had an amazing first half of his career and a really tough second half of his career. And that, part of that was because of the team he played on, for what it's worth. Uh, yeah, but offensively, he had a massive, massive dip. So I'm I'm really curious to see what happens. My gut says Roland and Helen just miss, but could they get there this year? They absolutely could. If they don't get there this year, they will get there next year. I feel pretty damn confident in that. Let's finish us out with this one, Mia. This is a really fun story here. Yes, let, let, us, let us hit the ice. I was a little yeah. premature earlier. Now we'll so, hit the ice. Penguins defenseman P.O. Joseph and older brother Matthew Joseph, who's a forward for the Sanders, lived out a childhood dream when they played each other for the first time in the NHL Friday night in Pittsburgh. Neither player recorded a point. Pittsburgh won 4-1. But they did enter the box score together when they drew coincidental 
high stick penalties. Their parents, Francie and France, watched from the stands. So they both entered the penalty box. P.O. sheepishly admitted his brother didn't deserve the penalty, admitting he might have accidentally high-sticked himself. Quote, I don't know if they thought this is going to be funny or something, that we're both going to get a penalty at the same time, but stuff happens. I'm sure my parents had a good laugh about it, but I didn't think it was fun. He says, there's the parents' reaction right there. I think that's great. Uh, what would the appropriate punishment around the house here be? Uh, to be put in timeout at the same time. Yeah. Um, well, I feel like by putting them, I mean, I know there's a, a barrier in a penalty box, but I was going to say to put them in the same area, like, isn't that more torture it might if you're be. at home? That's what I'm saying. Like, if you're at home and your parents put you and your sibling in timeout, but they say you have to go to the same room, uh, then you really have to fight it out. I can tell you this because my sister and I shared a room for the first, well, she was she's three years younger than me. So for the first 15 years of her life, we shared a room. And uh, whenever they sent us both to our room, because it was the same room, um, we would just kind of stare at each other and be like, this is your fault. But we wouldn't fight more. We would just kind of be like, few, like, like simmering, mm -hmm. like fuming in the I corner. Think this is a great story. I think this is so funny. It's amazing being able to play your own flesh and blood in the league, but to then be put in the penalty box at the same time. Your parents said that that picture of the parents, that is like an all timer. Look at this again. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I also I appreciate that. I want to briefly um, diverge for a second. Uh -huh. I appreciate that mom and dad each had their, yes. you know, one had the one's jersey on the other one had the other one's jersey yes. on. Um, but I do want to give a shout out to Jason and Travis Kelsey's mom her dedication with her split Jersey and she splits time between Kansas city and Philly. I love that. It's tough. Well, they, they, they could be playing each other in the super bowl. It's not impossible, which would be a hell of a story. I to... can't wait. I want to see if she's going to get a new Jersey. Finally, that's a split one. It would be a weird, wacky and wild story. And that's what we cover here on out of bounds. Every single week. We'll be back with you next Monday night, right here on the know your news network. Mia, anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, let's. Um, since I see a lot of folks, shout out to Ace Shack and a few of the others on the uh, or Ace Shock, excuse me, in the comments on YouTube. Um, I see a couple of folks wanting us to circle back to the National Football League. Uh, give me your prediction then, John. Do you see it being Eagles and Chiefs in the Super Bowl winners this week? According to my good friends over at my bookie, the ooh, ooh, this is some breaking news. Are you ready? The line has shifted. The Bengals are now a one point favorite in the AFC championship game meanwhile holding steady in philadelphia the eagles two and a half point favorites give me give me Bengals and eagles Ooh, you're gonna give ruin me, the, the kelsey family reunion john give me, give me a beagles super bowl Ooh, i like that beagles Boy. yeah i mean i listen i think the brock purdy storyline is fantastic but i think it's gonna end like you said if that eagles defensive front does I just what thought it does the eagles were unbelievable this past week they yeah. were amazing and Put an elite defense against an elite, healthy quarterback in Joe Burrow and just see who wins. And I think that's a really awesome thing. Nothing against Patrick Mahomes, who, again, his dad played Major League Baseball, but he, he's – He also has a – if he doesn't have a high ankle sprain, are we talking about this game the same way? No, if he if he doesn't have a high ankle sprain. But even Tony Romo was saying it's, it's just an unfathomably painful – injury for a quarterback to have to play through and look could he do it of course he's Patrick Mahomes we've seen he is an unbelievable grade a athlete and don't but, forget the, the Bengals with Joe Burrow three and oh against Kansas City Chiefs mm -hmm. in the last 17 months and they're not afraid to play them on the road either so that's that's something that we're gonna have to monitor but we'll be talking about that next week here on out of bounds as we'll see our Super Bowl uh, opponents decided, and we'll certainly be taking a deep dive into that. She's me, O'Brien. I'm John Alba. This has been Out of Bounds. That's a thing on her nose. We will see you next time.